Hey, it's Eric, and today we're going to talk about broadcast monitors. So I've seen a lot of questions on the internet. Do I need to go out and buy a Sony a BVM $40,000 monitor to be able to grade my work? And the answer is you don't. So while in the high-end production studios, we certainly are still using the Sony BVM series X300, 310, and 311 as our main reference displays, that's not the only display that can work for most workflows. There's a lot of lower cost solutions out there from um, other companies such as Flanders. Um, HP is making the Dream Colors, uh, which are computer displays that can be used. You have the Apple XDR displays. Um, now Atomos has come out with the Neon series. Small HD has their reference series. Um, and a consumer TV like the LG OLED or the Sony OLED TVs. So all of those can be set up and can be calibrated in a way that can be used as a reference grading display. For each monitor we choose, we're gonna have some things we have to give up and some things we'll gain. We've found that in a lot of our studios now, mo even the high-end studios, we're starting to use the LG OLED uh, panels in the larger sizes for our client monitors because they're big, we can get them in big sizes and they're easy to see and very easy to calibrate to match some of our reference panels. They also work very well in HDR and SDR. As well, Technicolor put in a lot of work many years ago to help them develop the displays and build in some of these controls, including uh, onboard pattern generators and CalMAN compatibility. So in this video, I'm gonna take uh, you through the setup of the LG OLED C2 42 inch display, which is what I'm using in some of my suites for my reference monitor. We have above us another LG OLED C2 65 inch display for our client monitor. Uh, and I find that this gives a really good balance of what the user would be seeing at home. So the monitor today that we're gonna look at is the LG OLED C2 42 inch uh, consumer display. And I'll put links in the description for that so you can find out where to get it. For the most part, it sells for just around $1,000 or under if you can find it on sale, which I think is a fantastic deal for a monitor of this quality. So the 42 inch is the smallest in the C2 series um, and is a really good size for a reference grading display. Um, it can be put on a desk. You can still sit fairly close to it without straining your eyes. Um, it gives you the highest ratio of brightness to size of panel um, and has all the features of the higher of the larger C2 panels. Now a couple drawbacks with the C2 series over the LG C1 series. The C1 series uh, and some of the earlier A series panels will actually support their own onboard pattern generators when you're using Cowman. Unfortunately, currently, as of this video, the onboard pattern generator in the C2 series is not working or not compatible with Calman. I am told that that will be updated soon and hopefully in the next couple months, um, we'll start to see that ability back and then you won't need an external pattern generator, which can be an additional cost. All right, so we're gonna go over the hardware that I'm gonna use in this video. Uh, and this is how I have my own setup configured. So for my video IO, I'm using a Blackmagic Ultra Studio 4K Mini. Uh, that gives me 4K uh, input and output via HDMI and SDI, uh, as well as HDR and SDR monitoring. Um, it's a little bit expensive, around $1,000 for the unit, um, and plugs in via Thunderbolt. But um, for a little less money, the Ultra Studio Mini Monitor it's a really great option for around $125. Has Thunderbolt in, uh, HDMI and SDI out, HDR and SDR in 1080p. Uh, for a pattern generator, we're using a Raspberry Pi. Um, again, these can be had for around $150. Uh, and then our colorimeter, we're using the x rite i1 display, which has now been superseded by the Calibrite. Uh, the last thing that's really important is make sure you're using high quality 8K Ultra HDMI cables. That way you can send a good 444 signal without any issues. So the first thing would be is get those set up um, and installed and then use the outputs of that to plug into your monitor. Now when calibrating, we're not gonna plug into um, Resolve for the calibration. We're gonna plug directly into our pattern generator and then we're gonna use the CalMan application. You're gonna to need to have a Windows PC available. Unfortunately, CalMan only runs on Windows. So if you're running a Mac, you can boot camp to a Windows uh, install and then run your CalMan app. 
but it is required that you have a Windows PC. It is not Mac compatible. I've got my HDMI input into my monitors, uh, and we'll get, we have a little USB-C or a USB micro power plug for the Raspberry Pi. So we're going to plug in the Raspberry Pi and get this powered up and plug in our HDMI cable. Now, I'm going to put a link in the description for the install and setup for the Raspberry Pi device and Pi generator or P generator, which is the, 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 the patch generator for the calibration. So over here uh, on my desktop, you can see I've got one of my Windows computers and I'm actually remote desktopping into it from my Mac workstation. Um, and you can see I have a couple applications up right now. So device control uh, is an application that allows us to link to a Raspberry Pi. There's a great web page here on the AVS forum on how to actually uh, get this installed, what tools you need, how to set it up. So once we have device control running, we can actually access it through uh, a web address. So, um, and again, it'll go over that in the link on how to access Pi Generator. So once we've got it accessed, we've got the website up and running, we can connect to the Raspberry Pi, and that will now become our pattern generator for our CalMan. So CalMan will be able to then communicate to the, the shell script and Pi generator that's running. It will see its web address and then generate patches or generate the colors that we need to the screen to be able to calibrate. So now that that's plugged into our PC, we're gonna take this little weight that's uh, provided and we're gonna put it over the back of the monitor and open up the calibrator. And we're gonna hang it over the center of the screen so that it falls right around in the middle of the screen. We wanna make sure that it's rested completely flush against the screen and not leaning to one side or the other. If it does that, you can get light leak in and you can get uh, bad uh, readings from the, uh, from the sen sensor. And then we're gonna come over here and we're gonna launch our CalMan application. So we're gonna find our CalMan home application and we're gonna launch it. When we're calibrating the LGs, we don't need to buy the entire CalMan professional suite, which is about $2,000. We can actually buy the CalMan home for LG, which is a $150 application. It's again, quite inexpensive for the display we're using. This will give you all the calibration features you need to calibrate just LG monitors. It won't allow you to calibrate your computer displays or some of your small HD displays if you have those as well, unfortunately. Um, but to be able to calibrate the LG, you can save the money uh, and just spend the $150 for your one broadcast display. If you do need to calibrate other displays like the, your, mo your computer monitors or other, other manufacturers, you can purchase the entire CalMan suite um, it's around $2,000, and that also has the ability to calibrate the AutoCal for LG. Um, and again, I'll put links in the description so you can see the differences in the packages and prices. So we're using the LG AutoCal or LG Home or uh, Auto Calibration tool. So once we launch the application, we're going to come back here and open a workflow template, um, and we're going to make sure that we're set up for the LG AutoCal template. We're going to load that in. And then we're gonna choose the OLED setting here since we're gonna be calibrating an LG OLED. Now with the LG AutoCal app, you can calibrate some of the new LG LCD displays like the Nanos or I think uh, QLEDs that they're making, but we really recommend the LG OLEDs for a reference broadcast monitor. So for this demonstration, we're gonna set up and calibrate an SDR mode and not HDR right now. Um, the processes are very similar. And in this screen, we're going to find our meter. So that would be our X-Rite. And we're going to find our pattern generator. So we're going to click find meter. So now we can see that it's found our meter, uh, our X-Rite i1 display. Um, and we are going to set this for LG, uh, for an OLED RGB. OK, so now we're going to find our pattern generator. So we're going to click find source. And we're going to choose the SpectraCal option. And then we're going to enter the IP address of our uh, Raspberry Pi. So we can go back to our web window under device control. And we can look at what our IP address is that we've assigned to this unit. So right now we can see that our IP address for our Raspberry Pi is 192.168.4.178. So we're going to go in here and type in 
192.168.4.178. And we're going to choose, make sure we choose the SpectraCal Unified Pattern Generator Control Interface. So we're going to click Connect. And we can see that that's now connected um, and the source has been found. Um, and we're going to leave all the settings here default. So we're going to leave all these settings here alone. Same with our X-ray, we're going to leave those settings alone as well. Now, you can, at this point, you can try to find your display. It will ask you later as well. Um, but I like to make sure that the display is connected before we start moving forward. So I like to come over here and say, find display. Choose LG OLED. And for us, we're going to choose for this model. We're going to choose the C2. Make sure that it's very important you choose the correct model that you're using. So if you're a C1 or A1 or one of the older B9s, make sure that you've chosen the right one so that it understands how uh, to connect. Now, we're going to come back over here and we're going to look at what our IP address is for our monitor. So for the LGs, we're going to click Settings and we're going to go to the All Settings mode. We're going to come up to General uh, Settings and scroll down to Network. Under Network, we're going to see we've already made a Wi-Fi connection. So we're going to look at our Wi-Fi connection here and then click Other Network Settings and click Advanced Network Settings. And if I move my calibrator out of the way, we can see that we have an IP address of 192.168.4.178. Now, of course, the settings will vary based on your network settings and how you've connected your display to the internet. I recommend using wireless. You can also use wired, um, but wireless with DHCP, it should automatically find an IP address and connect to your network very easily. So once we connect, it's going to search for the display, and we'll see this menu come up that says calibration start. Um, that means that we've now entered into the calibration mode on the TV, and the TV is prepared to take calibration data from CalMan. So now that we have our monitor set up, it's important to consider what our data range will be. Our data range is how we refer to the code values associated with black and white. So black in 8-bit being 0, and white being 255. But in many cases, we work in what we call limited or broadcast range, which is where we uh, limit the values slightly, where black being 16 and white being 235. Or in the case for today's calibration, what we call limited plus, which is 16 being black and 255 being white, again in 8-bit values. Now, what's important is that we make sure that all the devices in the chain are in the same settings. So if our pattern generator, our Raspberry Pi, is sending limited plus, then we want to make sure that both CalMan, which we can see here from the display uh, on the screen, uh, as well as our monitor are set to the same values. So the way we can check our monitor is we can come over here to the settings page. So we'll pick up our remote, go to settings, we'll come down to all settings. We'll come over here to advanced settings, brightness, and we'll scroll down, and under brightness, we'll see a setting here for video range. By checking that, we can choose three options, auto, limited, or full. In most cases, your monitor will come from the factory set to limited. In some cases, we've seen them set to auto. So it's important to set this to limited for this calibration exercise. You can set it back to full once you've calibrated, and if your resolve system is going to be set to full range. However, you can get some inaccuracies if you've calibrated to a limited range signal and you've switched it later to full. It is also possible with some pattern generators to calibrate in full range, especially once we get back the ability to use the LG internal pattern generator, which does calibrate in full range. So we're going to make sure we use the default values as 16 to 255, uh, 33 point calibration, and for this Example, we're going to actually use the SDR bright mode because um, we're going to overwrite the calibration that exists in there. Now, you can put different calibrations in each of your modes. So you could work in SDR cinema mode or SDR expert bright mode. Since I already have a calibration in cinema, we're going to add a new calibration to the ex uh, expert bright mode. So we're going to come over here now to our calibration targets. So for the most part, 
when we're delivering to things, say like a music video to YouTube or a non-HDR deliverable to something like uh, Amazon Prime or maybe um, another uh, streaming service that isn't taking an HDR deliverable, uh, and, and all we need to do is our SDR or Rec. 709, we want to be calibrated to a Rec. 709 color space. If we're delivering to feature film um, uh, that's going to be projected, so we're going to um, a projected feature film in theaters, we may want to calibrate to P3 or to DCI P3, which would change your white point to um, 6,000 Kelvin rather than 6,500, and also work in the wider P3 color space. Um, as well, if we're working for HDR deliverables, it's a general rule of thumb that we're going to uh, calibrate to a P3 color space. But for this example, since most of our viewers, most of you guys are going to be working towards a, a Rec. 709 delivery, we're going to leave this at a, at a Rec. 709. Now for gamma. The default here is 1886, which is a default gamma to help compensate for LCD displays that don't... Um, have good black reproduction. So if you're working with an LCD that isn't, that doesn't have a ton of backlight zones or is edge lit illuminated, 1886 is designed to add a bit more contrast in the very deep blacks to help get back some of that contrast that you lose from these backlit LCDs. But for OLED displays, we would we want to make sure that we calibrate to what we call a full power gamma. And you can see that reflected here in the notes that they give you for Calman. So now we have a few choices for gamma values. So many studios will calibrate to a gamma 2.4, which has kind of been the industry standard for many years. Um, and that's a good baseline, uh, can be used for broadcast television, can be used for internet. But what we're finding now is that most displays from your uh, Apple iPhones to your laptops, to even the default on your OLED displays is now set to a Gamma 2.2. I like the Gamma 2.2. I find that that gives me the best results and gives me a more uh, accurate result when my clients are seeing something and being reviewed on an iPad or on their MacBook displays. So we're gonna leave this at a Gamma 2.2 and we're gonna leave our, our white point at D65. Now D65, again, is very similar to what your camera. It's our color temperature. So we're setting our color temperature to a 6500 Kelvin. So this is where the coordinates on a CIE plot um, put our D65 or 6500 Kelvin. And we're gonna click next. Now in this first screen, we're gonna take some pre-calibration measurements. So we wanna see where the screen is at then we want to make some adjustments, and then we want to measure again to see what the changes were and if we made the screen better. This is where it comes to adjusting our room. So we don't want to do this in a bright, brightly lit room. We want to turn the lights down. We want to make the room dark because any reflected light off the screen is going to come back into our sensor and then give us bad readings. So I'm going to get up and close our curtains in here. So now that we have the room dark, we're gonna follow the directions here on the screen. So we're gonna click the read series button. And now, as we can see over here, our screen is gonna start cycling through the color patches that's needed to get these calibrations. So as we can see, as each patch is happening, we're starting to look on the screen. We can see the results of each patch. So in a perfect world, we want this line pretty much straight across and blue. We don't wanna see this separation in color. So we can see that this screen needs to be calibrated in the current mode that it's in because it's giving us these, these unequal values across the, the spectrum from shadow all the way to highlight. And then over here, we can see the luminance curve. So that's your gamma. So this is your gamut or your color space, and this is your gamma. So it looks right now like we're tracking really well on a Gamma 2.2. We don't have any, this gray line isn't coming above the reference yellow. And then down here is what we call the delta. The delta is our difference from the target. So we send a patch, we know what that value is, we read that patch and compare the value. And that offset is what we call the delta. And that's where it's reflected in this average error or maximum error. So we wanna have a very low average and max error as we read each one of these patches. 
So the next thing that's going to happen now that we've uh, done our white balance and our, and our gamma, the calibrator is going to start sending out color patches of different values, looking at how that white balance expands out to the entire spectrum. So over here, you can see all these little white boxes. And each white box represents a color patch or value that's being sent to the screen. And then the dot represents where it's being read. And then the difference is down here again, our delta or our difference between patch and reading. So we can see right now that most of our white point values or our, our color temperature is pretty close to the box. But we can start to see that we're getting some skew in our mid green and our mid red orange. Our blues are looking pretty good. They're within the box, which is mostly ideal. But we're definitely seeing more skews in our reds and oranges. So now that we've finished, we can see that for the most part, we've got a pretty good calibration on our blues and our white and our color temperature, our, our white point. But we can see that we really start to skew out here on our reds and oranges and our greens are quite far out of our box or with a high delta. And that's gonna be reflected right down here. Um, we can see that our, some of our delta values are getting up around five and we have a high uh, average error and max error reading. So we know we need to calibrate the screen. We can see it from our RGB balance. We can see that our points are hitting each of the boxes, but we do know that we have a pretty good gamma tracking, so that's good. So now let's move to the next screen. So now in this screen, it's gonna ask for you to do a full DDC reset. So by doing this, what we're doing is we're resetting any values that you've put into your screen, um, maybe settings you put in or any color calibrations that you've put in to the current setting that you're working on, which would be SDR bright. Um, and that will wipe, uh, wipe those settings out, put it back to default, and then that allows the system to be able to build upon that. If you've got a bunch of settings in there that could affect your display, um, that could cause a problem. So now that we've done the full DDC reset, we need to verify the settings on the monitor. So we're gonna pick up our remote and go into settings. We're gonna to go to all settings. We'll go to picture. We're gonna to go to advanced settings. And under brightness, we're gonna verify that our auto dynamic contrast is off, peak brightness is off, and our video range we talked about earlier is still set to limited. Then motion care needs, motion eye care needs to be turned off. We'll come back up to color. We don't have any settings to change there. We can go to clarity and we'll make sure that super resolution, noise reduction, MPEG noise reduction, smooth gradation, real cinema, and true motion are all turned off. Once we've verified all those, we can exit out of our settings and we can head back to our calibration. So then we're gonna go to next and we're gonna make sure calibration is enabled. So this checkbox needs to be enabled. If it's not, go ahead and check it. And then we'll go to our next screen and here we can measure our peak luminance. So this is again another place where it's a bit up to your preference. So I like to set my peak luminance uh, in SDR at around 140, 115 to 140 nits. The specification for Rec. 7 and 9 is 100 nits, but I find that because most of us now are watching uh, TVs in quite bright displays up to 300 nits, I get a better sense of my grade and where things are gonna go if I'm a little bit brighter than the, the reference standard for Rec. 709. So we're gonna start letting it throw out these patches. We can see that it's reading at 225 nits. We're gonna bring that way down here, try to get us around 115 to 150 nits. So right now at 125, I'm gonna go a little bit lower. So we're right now at 116 nits, that's great. So we're gonna hit stop and then we're gonna move on to the next patch. All right, so this is our grayscale multi-point. So this is now how we start to create a LUT and auto calibrate the display. So as we can see here, it says press the auto cal button and select the uh, SDR data points to auto calibrate. So we're gonna click the auto cal button here and you'll see a menu pops up. Now again, this goes back to our earlier conversation about video range or data range levels. So we wanna make sure that we're we have the correct levels chosen. And we can see that the default for this is our LG 26 point SDR 16 to 255. So we're gonna keep that set correctly the way it is and default. And uh, we're gonna click okay. 
All right, so what's happening here is a lot like in our pre-calibration data screen. The cowman is sending a signal to the pattern generator, telling it what value it wants to display on the screen, and then the pattern generator is sending that color in a patch to the screen, what we call an L12 square. The sensor now, the x right is now reading that patch and sending the data back to Calman, and it's looking for a difference in those values. So as we can see here, there's this small box in the center. That's the value that, it, that Calman is sending out and it expects to see back. And the little white dots that we're getting are the values that the calibrator is sending back to Calman. So it can now look at those differences and then see if it's different or the same. If it's different, then Cowman is then sending a LUT to the TV, just like we would put on our camera or in our Resolve. It's actually creating a LUT, sending that to the TV, and then resending that patch and looking at the difference again. And every time it sees a difference, it sends a new LUT and tries to get it closer and closer to the center of this little box. So we can see in all the values that we've already sent out now, it's actually getting pretty close to the center of that box. We can see it reflected here in our EOTF. And it will continue to make these adjustments, trying to get closer and closer to getting a perfect RGB balance and a perfect gamma balance. Anytime it's off, it's going to work itself back in by sending multiple LUTs until it's correct. And it will continue to do this for uh, sometimes up to about 20 minutes until it's got a good calibration across the board in both luma, luminance and RGB balance. So, so color space gamut and gamma. So we can sit here and we can watch it make these changes and we can see now how in our highlights, we've got a really good RGB balance happening. We don't have a lot of separation um, between our, our blue, red, and green channels here. It's, it's tracking really nicely. And we can look here in our gamma which is this, the gamma 22 curve, where again, we're tracking really nice without a lot of delta or a lot of separation between the gray line and the yellow line. As well, looking down here, we can see that our new deltas for both RGB and gamma are really nice and low. Like we're getting very low um, uh, separation from patch values. So, that means that the calibrator is working really well and we're getting a really good calibration. You can see how now we have a little dot that's outside the box. So we can see that it just applied a LUT and went a little too far. So it's gonna apply another LUT and reread and now it's back in the center of the box. So we can see that how the computer is working to recalibrate the display, display at each read that it's sending and get closer and closer to that low delta or low read, and we can see that it just reflected that here. As it made the adjustment, our RGB balance got balanced out really nice again. All right, so we can see the calibration has finished, uh, and it's come up with a really good tracking um, from shadow to highlight. We can see that it's tracked really well, both in our balance um, with and without luminance, and we can see that our luminance tracking is really good. We can see that we have a really low delta all the way across. Um, and it's telling us that it took 18 minutes and 34 seconds with 150 reads. So that's a good little bit of how much time you can expect in each setup here. So we're going to click OK, and then we're going to move to the next page. So the next page here is where we're actually going to create the final 3D LUT, and we're going to upload that to the monitor. And this is going to start to send out color patches like we saw on the previous uh, couple screens. Uh, to then calibrate each of the color values so we know we're, we're hitting our targets. So again, we're going to click the Auto Cal button here, and our dialog comes up. Now we have a couple options here. Uh, so we have LUT, Lightning LUT, Matrix LUT, LUT um, Fixed Grids. So for the LG OLED uh, C2, it's recommended to use the Lightning LUT. Um, and again, our Simpty Plus or Limited Plus that we've talked about earlier, our video ranges are set, so we're in video range or data range. Uh, so we're going to leave all this default, and we're going to click OK. All right, and after we've clicked OK, we can see that it's going to start uh, updating the display and sending patches, just like in the last panel. It's going to start sending all these color patches that you can see on the bottom. So every one of these colors is going to get generated and sent over to the display. It'll take a reading for each one. Uh, look at the offset and adjust and make a LUT so that we can get 
good RGB balance, not just in our white point, which is what we did in the last screen, but now throughout the entire CIE spectrum. All right, so we can see that in 11 minutes, it did a total of 102 reads. We're gonna click okay, and we're gonna move to the next screen. So we can come back here, um, and this is now to recheck our brightness, so we can, um, we can actually look at uh, what the brightness and contrast is after calibration. I generally just go click next and move out of this. So we're gonna come back here and disable calibration. So we'll turn that off because now we've finished the calibration and we're gonna move on to now verify the calibration and make sure that the screen is calibrated and looks good. So we're gonna click next after that and we're gonna do our post calibration verification. So um, same as with the first screen, we're gonna click read series and we're gonna watch this uh, shoot out the patches. Again, very similar to what we did in the very first screen uh, where we looked at how each of the calibration points, um, how close we are and how much average error or delta we have between each point. So we're gonna watch this happen. Uh, it takes about another uh, five to 10 minutes. So we'll notice already as it's uh, sending out the patches and reading back that we're already getting a much better performance on our RGB balance. Here, remember before we were seeing big separation in the red uh, channel all the way up to about our midtones, and our error and average error and max error performance was more around three and seven, and now it's 0.3 and 0.5. So we can see that the calibration has really made a big dif difference in the overall performance of the display. Okay, so as this is finishing up, we can start to see how our calibration has affected the screen. Um, now some variation is normal. We can see there's a little variation in the reds here or oranges and some of our red values here. That's pretty normal and that can be attributed to a few different things. You could potentially have a little bit of light leak coming in from a room that's not completely dark. Um, it's possible that maybe your screen wasn't warmed up enough. Um, and also just as screens get older, they will have some variations in color. Um, what we don't want to see is big, heavy variations way outside the box here or, or, or you know, greens reporting way here. We also really want to see stuff out at the edges of the gamut here tracking really well. If these were really far out, I might redo the calibration and start over again. Um, but seeing that these couple of ones are still close to our box and our max error performance is still quite low, I would say that's within my tolerance for a calibrated screen. Um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that you really want to let our screens warm up for about 30 to 40 minutes before you calibrate. Don't just turn a screen on and start calibrating um, because you can see some variances um, when that happens. I'm going to click next and move on. So now we can see our pre-calibration and post-calibration differences. We, we were really close before um, in our patches. We just got a little bit tighter in, in our reds and our greens. Um, and a little bit tighter on our edge of gamut performance. So we can see that that didn't change significantly, but look at the major differences we had in our shadow to, to highlight um, RGB balance. So that would be in our whites and grays um, and our delta in that, how significantly far off we were um, before and now we're almost zero. So this is really good performance from the calibration and shows that we have a well calibrated monitor that falls well below our, our maximums. Um, and so now what we can do is just save that data for future reference. So we can click that and save. Um, and from here, we can close Calman and go back to showing you how to set this up in Resolve. All right, so we're into our test project here, which is one of our lens test videos, and we have a signal going to the screen. So we've actually come out of our uh, Ultra Studio with HDMI because it's a consumer display using HDMI inputs. So we're coming out of the screen HDMI, uh, making sure to use an ultra high bandwidth HDMI cable that supports up to 8K. That's very important because you're gonna be sending a 444 signal and that is incompatible with some of the lower cost HDMI cables. So make sure you get a good quality cable and one that supports up to 8K video. So we're gonna send that out to the display. Um, we're gonna come in here to our project settings. 
we can see in our project settings right now that we have our data level set to video. Now remember we set our monitor to limited and we know that our pattern generator was set to limited and our calibration was set to limited. So we want to maintain that consistency across our devices and we want to make sure that in our video monitoring settings here in Resolve we are as well working in video range. Um, that also means then that you're going to be sending a video in 10 bit depth. Um, you can still send 444 video by having this checkbox on, but to do video range uh, or limited range uh, data values, we must be in 10 bit. Now, if we want to work in 12 bit, we can move to full range, and it is acceptable to uh, just change your monitor from limited to full, um, and you can still maintain the same calibration. However, you will lose some accuracy in your darker blacks and shadow tones. Um, it's minimal, but you can lose accuracy. So if you want to perfect that, you can recalibrate using a full range um, device that can send patches in full range, um, and you can calibrate that way. Or once they fix the internal pattern generators in the C2 devices, then we can calibrate in full range using the internal pattern generators. So going back to our resolve, we have our 444 checkbox on. Uh, we're going to be sending video data ranges and be in, in 10 bit. So that's how our project was set up. So we're going to cancel out of that box. So we can now uh, look through some of our footage uh, and make sure that the calibration has taken and that we're getting good tracking with our results. So I like to look at a range of both dark and light footage that we shot. So stuff shot, maybe some nighttime footage, a little bit of daytime, some of our test footage here where we have a good broad range of dark shadows and bright highlights to make sure that we don't have any errors that came across in the LUT. So some of the errors that you can see in a badly generated LUT might be some really heavy crunchiness in the blacks, a lot of noise or pixelation, or maybe really bad values like really red, oversaturated. And if that happens, uh, take a step back and start your calibration over, do the full DDD reset, and then continue on. So I hope this video was helpful and shows that you don't necessarily have to spend $45,000 for a reference display. Uh, with a $1,000 uh, consumer LG OLED TV and a couple of tools, you can really get an accurate display that can show you accurate colors and be able to color grade uh, and get a good idea of what your viewers are going to see when, when it's put out in the world. So I hope this video was helpful. Look for our next videos. We're going to start to talk about how to set up your projects uh, and maintain color accuracy using transforms and good processes. So that's coming up soon. Uh, we'll look for you in the next one.